your career is really interesting because you started off in a band in the major label system, went through then kind of becoming a solo artist. You joined a band in a very different context uh, and then expanded out into like writing with other people for other people. Uh, you started producing other people as well. Um, were there like, I'm really actually interested in a few key moments, like the transition phases from like one mode shifting to another. Like when you were coming out of Lilix, was there a specific moment where you were like, I'm going to do a solo record? Was there a specific moment when the opportunity to join Golden Youth came up where you're like, oh, you know what, being in a band in a whole different way would be really cool? And when then was there a specific moment where you kind of consciously chose to start writing? Like yeah. what were kind of some of the, can, can you describe to us some of those inflection points where your roles and responsibilities and commitments all changed and evolved? I think that when I left Lilix, I wasn't sure I would be in music period because I had been quite disenchanted as many people are after being on a major label. I didn't really want to do anything about, I just didn't want to do music the same way I've been doing it. So I hit the ground running, just playing in all the bands I could when I first left and oh, really? integrated okay. myself in Vancouver. I just, I joined all the bands that asked me to. I played bass, I played keyboard, you know, the smallest shows imaginable from a warehouse to like a proper venue to like, you know, weird punk underground, whatever you want to call them. And that for me was, um, it actually turned into like 10 years of my life of doing that in Vancouver, just playing in all the bands, playing so many shows. And in the meantime, I was trying to sort of find out who I was as a songwriter for my own music. So a lot of that fed into the way I approached my own music, which perhaps for better or for worse, um, worse influenced me maybe a little bit too much in the sort of like indie punk direction, um, where I kind of dropped all of my pop influences and, and expertise, I guess, from spending the years in LA doing the time and just sort of said, fuck that, I wanna make some underground shit so people think I'm cool <laughs> or so I get respect because back in the day, women in music were not respected. It's, it's changed a lot, but like being a pop artist in the early 2000s was a nightmare, so. <laughs> um, and I mean that in the best way because like I am the I am the toughest person I know because of that, so. Um, that sort of, it took me a long time to figure out who I wanted to be as a solo artist. But in the meantime, I did get to join a lot of amazing bands and network with people and realize that like, oh, I like working with other people when it's for their music and I like writing with other people. This feels familiar yet safe. I don't feel threatened by this because I'm helping someone else and not having to necessarily do anything I don't want to do for myself. And were, were you um, doing that in the context more just like playing in bands around town instead of someone being like, I'm going to put you in with Louise to write. So it's like much more of an yeah. organic process. Way more organic. Yeah, okay. it was super like roots approach, I guess you could say, because I never really felt like I I paid my dues, I guess, when I was in Lilix because we sort of went from like tiny little band to like massive uh, opportunities given to us and I felt like there was a missing element of like my development as a musician I guess and as a music person which doesn't make a lot of sense to be honest I kind of wish I just like stuck with like <laughs> the opportunities I've been given but we all make these mistakes in our 20s or le learning lessons but uh well it's funny because I didn't actually know that about you like yeah. you know even the way I phrased that question was like oh you left the band and then you went solo so but it, it's kind of interesting I think just seeing the incredible strengths you do have as a producer and especially like with people and playing and like bringing things together like what you're describing there your entire 20s was basically like your training to be a producer right? pretty or, much or a collaborator yeah. who you yeah know, so definitely that, that and I spent a lot of time I think to I mean I the first thing I did when I left Lilix was buy an mbox believe it or not and I started nice. working in Pro Tools and I just was like I don't get it because I never took the time to really learn and I've never been to engineering school and I, I really don't learn very well by like reading manuals so I knew that I would get there I knew that I was going to do that eventually I just wasn't sure how or when yet so you're right though I think a lot of the sort of being thrown into weird situations where you're working with like people you don't really know and having to neutralize different personalities and find like the strength in different people and that even came into play when I started putting together my own band um, and I think that's sort of what became more interesting to me than the actual live performance itself I actually don't like performing live at all <laughs> I've never been a big fan of that so um, yeah behind the scenes stuff and, and actually collaborating with people and 
finding out how to get the best products we can together is really what gets me going and ignites the spark, I think. Great. And, sense, what, yeah. and what, when was the first time like you were handed like full responsibility to deliver, to deliver a record for someone else as a producer? That was with like in budgets yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. 2016, uh, Jonathan at 604 Records, he asked me to produce a record for a new band he'd signed called Fion. They were two, they are two, uh, two young women who are twins and as a result, the most incredible harmonizers you'll ever meet because there's something about the way that sisters can sing together that is just totally magical. Um, so I was, yeah, I was given the privilege of producing their first record and it was incredible. They have a studio in at the label that we worked out of. So that in terms of like budget resources, we kind of had a pretty open field in that term. We didn't really have to think about like getting everything done in four days in this huge high budget studio. Um, so I had the luxury of time as well, where I could sort of like work with another band and see who I was as a producer. Mm -hmm. um, which is a perfect first opportunity because I really felt like I had something to bring to the table. I could help them feel good about themselves as young songwriters and singers. And I also had the resources to really like dive into the process of producing for somebody else without the incredible pressure of really crunching numbers all the time because of the, the studio that we had available to us. And working with Pedro, who's the best engineer and I am the worst engineer. I was at the time, like just horrible. So. Um, yeah, it was kind of like the perfect entry point for me. Right. And it's, I mean, it's worth saying by that point what you would have been in studios for like 15 years or something because you started so young. So it wasn't like this was your first yes. time making a recording. No, like, I mean, I've been making records since I was like a child. So yeah. I, the, the how to make a record, is I know what to do. But there is a lot of stuff that you don't know yet because of, uh, I don't know, like there's stuff that comes up in production that you would never think of. I mean, I'm still learning every day. I'm just like, how did I not put that on this hard drive? Like, what is wrong with me? Like, there's so many little things that I just haven't even thought about. So, uh, but yeah, it's been it's been pretty. I've been very lucky. And what what would you say would be like? You know, we're all. You're absolutely right. We're always learning. But what would be one or two of the kind of biggest shifts in perspective or things you'd have learned from like the result of doing that record in that particular context? Oh, things that I've learned probably. I was really, when I reflected on the experience, I was very grateful that we did so much pre-production because we did build that record as like a live folk rock record and that came from performances. So getting the right performances out of all the players and having that clear was was huge. Um, so you were like running rehearsals before you got to the studio and did you like assemble yeah. the band and stuff as well around them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, amazing. I hired players and we actually had the we, we got to work with some members of the VSO for some string arrangement parts, which oh, was wow. like crazy. That's the Vancouver think, Symphony Orchestra for those not, not yes. down with the lingo. Okay, cool. That's amazing. I'm a big fan. I go to the symphony every time I can. I mean, I can't right now, obviously, but um, <laughs> the Orpheum in Vancouver, they just it's, it's my favorite thing to do. Um, I think in retrospect, though, I, I do realize that my weakness as a producer is that I'm not fast on Pro Tools at all, and that is the sort of universal language that people tend to sort of communicate and exchange files in. Not that it's a huge deal, like you can send audio files any way you want from any program you want, but um, yeah, that was like a big thing for me is being like, yeah, I gotta I gotta take the time to like get better at this because it'll make my life easier. Ultimately, mm -hmm. it's not really about anyone else, but just like how I do things. So. So yeah, you got like an, an even balance of like, oh, this worked really well and this is what I want to kind of like improve kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And I'm, every record I'm, I'm doing is still like that. I'm, I'm finding that the more control I have over everything, the happier I am <laughs> and the happier the artist is. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I look up to a lot of people who have their own studios like Jason Corbett over at Jackknife Sound, who you and I know because he played on my record, mm -hmm. amazing guitar player and the, the lead singer of actors and his whole setup is kind of like my dream just having his own studio and just operating everything himself and it just that amount of control is what i really like um i love working out of any studio because i i feel very comfortable in any studio because i grew up in them but i think that's a huge thing is just realizing that 
now modern producers tend to just work out of the box at home and like that's like your setup obviously is a little bit more than just working out of a box and I look behind you and I see all of your well, I mean, that, that, that's what this room is like. Yeah, my place in Montreal was all set up for tracking. Yeah. But it's also like, yeah, you go through that phase once you've had all that where when you go, oh, actually, for me now, it's like if I'm recording, like, I need Pedro. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Because it's like, yes, yeah. I can. I can engineer. But yeah. it's like, but having a brilliant person who's fully dedicated with that headspace not only gets yeah. a better result on an engineering side, but then means as a producer with all these other elements we're talking about, you yeah. can have that conversation so much more. Well, that's um, the thing too, like tracking. I love tracking vocals myself. Like that, mm -hmm. I love engineering vocals. It's something that I found that it, it just makes everything easier for everyone because yeah. I'm very particular and specific. But I think when it does come to like the production side, a lot of the creativity is still crushed for me because I can't like do things fast enough to keep up with my brain. Right, so right, having right. someone like Pedro around is amazing. Yeah. Um, I hope to get that fast at engineering one day, but I'm talking also in the context of like, I tend to do more live things because yeah. there are a lot of producers at home that just work out of their computer and are super fast and yeah. totally efficient. And that's great too, because it's a different kind of process. But yeah. with what I've done in the past, I mean, I can't engineer like a full orchestra myself yet in the way that I'd like to for my standards. <laughs> right, right, right. Awesome. Hey, let's get a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, Andrew Riley is saying, track list question for Louise. Uh, was there any specific reason for not including a cover song on Portraits? Not that I'm complaining, even oh, if I absolutely I love the previous ones, especially your versions Aww. of Gypsy's Wife. Thank you. That's funny. I actually... I don't know why I didn't do a cover. That was oh, sort actually, of my tradition. Let me just... In, let, like, let's get a bunch of questions in here for Louise. This is our kind of Q&A section. So... Uh, yeah. So you're saying you didn't know why you didn't have a cover? It wasn't a conscious decision? No, it wasn't. I actually, yeah, I don't know why I didn't do that. I think maybe I just never found the right cover. But also, I like finding the right cover. It's a fun goal for me. I don't know why I didn't do that. I played a lot of stuff live that wasn't really translating as well as I'd like to. Um, not well enough to put on a record, so... Yeah, maybe next time. <laughs> hmm, okay, cool. Uh, and then uh, Sky Junior ninety five is saying, Louise, are you already thinking about the next album? I only just started thinking about it. I have not had any time. I toured Portraits last year because uh, it came out in November, and then I got to tour right after. But I thought I would maybe be doing a bit more promo with that record, um, but I can't. <laughs> because of the pandemic and I've also been working on a bunch of other people's records so I haven't really had time to sit down and do it yet but I did start writing a few weeks ago just for the sake of it so it, it's starting to develop and I will be finishing it I believe by the end of this year if I'm lucky writing it I mean not recording it <laughs> but I've later I've just had no time which is weird because usually I do um but yeah do you and feel also, like is there a voice in your head going oh my god I gotta write or is there are you just like you're excited about everything else you're working on, I feel like, from our conversations on yeah. the touch base. I'm pretty excited about working on everyone else's stuff right now. I'm really happy with that. But there is now the feeling like this this is starting to happen a little bit with my writing. I'm like, am I intentionally avoiding writing because I want because I think that I'm stuck? Or am I just not ready yet? And I'm not really sure because sometimes I take many years between records sometimes I have like stuff ready to go right away uh, and right now I don't really yeah I'm just not really sure what I want to do yet so I've been enjoying my time how I've been spending it now and uh, I'm just looking for the right kind of spark I guess to make the writing feel natural I feel like knowing how much you've been working on stuff and developing and practicing like all these other aspects of like arsenals in your tool belt, so to speak, just like my intuition about you as a, as a friend and artist and producer, Louise, is like mm -hmm. w you're kind of in, you're in the montage training sequence in your own personal kung fu film. I am, Do you know what I mean? So you're like yeah, up at the dojo totally. on top of a mountain and you've been doing it through the seasons <laughs> and you're totally. you know, you're punching a big log or something like that or, or carrying rocks under a waterfall and I think yeah. that yeah at some point you'll know like hmm it's time for me and you'll come and walk down and you'll have like this entire new arsenal of stuff which you'll apply to your next record. Yeah. And I think you'll like you'll kind of amaze yourself. I hope so. Yeah. That's a nice that's a nice thing to think about. I think that you're right though. I have been so focused like every day I've just been like on my computer, 
learning about something tiny that I never realized existed before, which completely changes the way I do things for this, which will change the way I write. So yeah, I, I am in my, my action montage right now. <laughs> totally. So good. All right. Abate Entertainment in Boston is saying, do you prefer performing or producing? Producing. I hate performing. I hate it. And you're it's talking worse. performing live, like, right? Yeah, performing yeah. live. Okay. I hate it. Never liked it. I love karaoke, though. Not sure why. <laughs> okay. And what about performing in the studio? Uh, love it. Love it. So I love, you're, you're I love, like, like happy in the studio. Oh, yeah. I could spend, and I do spend all day there. Like, not during pandemic times because it just doesn't feel right. But I, I mean, before everything shut down, I still think I was averaging like 10 to 17 hours in there every day. Um, just cause like you got to get stuff done, but I just love being there. It makes me feel like I have a purpose. <laughs> Amazing. Great. Even if that just means at my computer at home, like not, it doesn't have to be like a studio, but yeah, just working on, on something. Hey, we hope you enjoyed that video. A couple of more links here for some talks we think you'll like. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and otherwise head over to completeproducer.net so that you can connect with other music making geniuses from all over the world. We'll see you there.